On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and filmmakers. In this week's On Story, Mork and Mindy and Saturday Night Live writer David Misch meet the parents' screenwriter John Hamburg, High Fidelity's Scott Rosenberg, Machete writer Alvaro Rodriguez, and professor and author Greg Garrett. Billy Wilder's life shaped a particular storytelling sensibility. He could be cutting and cynical, his laughter a force field against despair, but most of his stories have a sensitivity to even some of his most broken characters, an empathy for human failure. And often he held out for his audiences the hope of hope. In this episode, our panelists deconstruct iconic director Billy Wilder's greatest films. First of all, I was that guy that didn't know Billy Wilder when I was pursuing my career, or beginning my career as a screenwriter. And then I watched a lot of Billy Wilder's movies and was totally blown away. So I think for me, there, uh, there's so many things we could focus on. I'll just focus on a couple of things that have inspired me about him. First of all, uh, his, just how specific his characters are and that he, he creates protagonists for which we have great empathy. Even if they're anti-heroes, like in Sunset Boulevard, we, we still sympathize with, uh, with his character. It's, it's the uh, attention to detail in his character work, and as it just in terms of screenwriting craft, the, the, his screenplays are just models of economy and setup and payoff. That, that's something that is so hard to do in writing, setup and payoff, because the brain doesn't work that way. You can't process everything. Um, at once, but he plants something in the first act that pays off in the third act, and it's just, it feels inevitable yet fresh, and that was really inspiring to me. And then just um, something Greg said just about his, this, he's a hopeful cynic, and I think that's so important. I mean, I, I love how cynical his movies are, but he is hopeful, and he fi his characters have little moments of grace and tenderness, and that really uh, stuck with me. You see, the body of a young man was found floating in the pool of her mansion with two shots in his back and one in his stomach. Nobody important, really. Just a movie writer with a couple of B pictures to his credit. <laughs> the poor dope. He always wanted a pool. Well, in the end, he got himself a pool. Only the price turned out to be a little high. It's interesting in that watching it now, and, and I had always just assumed, it's been a little while since I've seen it, that it's it's immediately clear from the beginning that it's being narrated by a dead man, but I don't know that it is all that immediately clear mm -hmm. that this is the vo same voice, because he does change from this guy to I, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, you know, unless you recognize William Holden's face, which is not a close up, you may not catch that the first time around, so it is a conceit. Let's go back about six months and find the day when it all started. I was living in an apartment house above Franklin and Ivar. Things were tough at the moment. I hadn't worked in a studio for a long time. So I sat there grinding out original stories, two a week. Only I seem to have lost my touch. Maybe they weren't original enough. Maybe they were too original. All I know is they didn't sell. It's an interesting thing. There's that idea of like, again, the narrator of the story being a reliable or unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. And if he's dead, you know, that is kind of like play, you know, kind of ups the stakes a little bit. It's kind of an interesting thing. You can see how voiceover can be done in a very effective way. And it's when the voiceover is telling us something that we're not actually necessarily seeing on screen. It's not really, he is, there is a reporting kind of quality to it. He's talking about, you know, the two shots in the front and the back and one in the front and the guy in the pool. 
but there's there's an added element to that voiceover that's giving us nuance, it's giving us character, that's giving us flavor for what this is. Because this is yeah. this definitely falls into sort of a later film noir period that started in the late thirties and through the forties. And you know, there's like noir titles like I Married a Dead Man by Cornell Woolrich and yeah. all those kinds of things. So that idea is very much keeping in the zeitgeist and the time and the tone of these kinds of movies. But also it allows, I think it allows him to sort of meander in that first act because, because it's like, holy shit, there's a dead man. How, how, how did we get here? Yeah. So you're allowed to a little, be a little bit more laconic in your pacing up, up until he meets Nora, you know, mm -hmm. it's, or it takes its time. Yeah. And I think that, that it's an old trick that like, we always do where it, is if you have, if you have an exciting movie but, but it really doesn't get started until they always tell you, you know, what you should do is, it's sort of what he did in Goodfellas with the trunk and the, yeah. you know, and it's like, oh, we're gonna catch up to that. So like, take your, take your okay. most exciting thing, open the movie and say, you might be wondering how we got here. And then, yeah. you know. Which also has the voiceover. Right, yeah. exactly. This is another film, like most of Billy Wilder's, made during the era of the production code. You cannot show people having an affair without having terrible things happen to them, and yet, Early on, we want them to get together because of the way that they interact together. I was thinking about that dame upstairs and the way she had looked at me. And I wanted to see her again, close, without that silly staircase between us. I wasn't long, was I? Not at all, Mrs. Dietrichson. Hope I've got my face on straight. Perfect for my money. Neff is the name, isn't it? Yeah, two Fs, like in Philadelphia. You know the story. What story? Philadelphia story. Suppose we sit down and you tell me about the insurance. My husband never tells me anything. Which is perfect. And just what, what I noticed this time, just directorially, I mean, that whole, you know, when it, when it comes out of the master and, she, and she's just walking and it's on her and he's just yeah. talking, 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 talking. Mm -hmm. And that's when she's basically formulating the entire plan right there, just back and forth. And he, the camera's on her and, and Fred McQuarrie's going. I have a very attractive policy here. Wouldn't take me two minutes to put it in front of your husband. For instance, for writing a new kind of 50% retention feature in the collision coverage. You're a smart insurance man, aren't you, Mr. Neff? Well, I've been at it 11 years. Doing pretty well? Mm, it's a living. You handle just automobile insurance or all kinds? All kinds. Fire, earthquake, theft, public liability, group insurance, industrial stuff, and so on, right down the line. Accident insurance? Accident insurance? Sure, Mr. Dietrichson. And what's so cool about that, you said she's formulating the plan, which we know after we've seen the movie, but in that moment, we don't know. What the hell is she walking back and forth for? What's that expression on her face? Again, pulling us in, really uh, dynamic. And, and of course, the dialogue. I worked on a show called Police Squad, where the whole idea was that the dialogue should never let you know it's a comedy. You only <laughs> put that together from other things. And once again, leaving something out, in this case, leaving out what her motivation is, what she's thinking, while the actual dialogue is boring, that's just masterful. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I was taken too with, um, you know, you hear Fred McMurray plays this kind of amiable guy, sort of, he's an insurance guy, he's de you know, and she comes in guns blazing in, in the towel, so she has, she's kind of um, leading the scene, and then, but then you cut downstairs and he, his voiceover says quite quickly what he wants, mm -hmm. which is he's, in, he's not interested in selling her insurance, he wants to sleep with her. Um, and that imbues the scene. To, to me, that changed the whole scene. So then he's talking about boring insurance, but he knows to, he wants. We know he wants to yeah. sleep with her. And so I think it's you don't have to use a voiceover. He does, of course, in this situation. But it's like the, he letting us know what your protagonist wants. Um, suddenly, the scene is filled with so much tension because you know it's not just her; it, it's him too. Mm -hmm. One other dialogue thing: uh, they keep the liquor locked up. So that's a laugh line, and it got a laugh in this room but it's a film noir. It's a film noir about murder and, and, and betrayal. Where would the living room be? In there, but they keep the liquor locked up. It's all right, I always carry my own keys. These little touches of humor are part of life. Uh, too often, I think some people doing drama think that comedy will ruin it, but it won't, it'll enhance it. When we exhale like that, then we get back, a moment later, we get back into the tension of the situation. The sex banner is obviously great, too, 45 miles an hour thing. And one of the great things about movies of that time is that women had great roles. Uh, this got lost uh, later. But the whole idea of romantic comedy and the uh, tension-filled uh, uh, sexual drama was that the women gave as good as they got. So he makes mm -hmm. innuendos, and she makes innuendos right back. 
and uh, that makes us feel she's a, a worthy uh, opponent's not the right word, but a worthy partner when they end up getting together. My husband. You were anxious to talk to him, weren't you? Yeah, I was, but uh, I'm sort of getting over the idea, if you know what I mean. There's a speed limit in this state, Mr. Neff. 45 miles an hour. How fast was I going, officer? I'd say around 90. Suppose you get down off your motorcycle and give me a ticket. Suppose I let you off with a warning this time. Suppose it doesn't take. Suppose I have to whack you over the knuckles. Suppose I bust out crying and put my head in your shoulder. Suppose you try putting it on my husband's shoulder. That tears it. And I think, too, in the other kind of example from the screwball comedy world is that when two people first meet each other in screwball comedy, they sort of can't stand each other. And there's at least a sensibility here where it's like she's pushing him away as far as his sexual advances go. Even though she's, in pushing him away, she's really trying to pull him in to do this other thing that he does, he's not completely cognizant of yet. Uh, and that they end up together at some point along the storyline, and that's, that's also here, um, that, that, that playing with that, that tension. Just one other thought I had um, is that, you know, to apply to today in our filmmaking today, which, and, which is we can say anything now. Um, I mean, I make R-rated comedy, so there's not a lot of, uh, you can say anything, and, and, and uh, you don't have to allude to things, but that can be a trap as well, because obviously they couldn't do, say the things we can say in movies nowadays, so he's using all of this language to talk about, we all know what they're talking about, but he's not hitting it on the head, it's subtext. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think it's interesting, when, when we now have no parameters, um, but people talking about what they're not, you know, not talking about what you're really talking about, I think is much more interesting than, than hitting it on the head. I think one of the uh, great striking things about Wilder is that he's so contemporary. Uh, that cynicism has something to do with it, but his dialogue is always fresh. It doesn't seem so rooted to the time as some old movies. And look, he made 60s, so they're not all that way, but most of them really are that way. And the language in them, he just delights in language, and we should mention right up front, I.A.L. Diamond, his, uh, and by the way, the initials I.A.L. evidently stood for nothing, but he, he was uh, Wilder's longtime collaborator and a brilliant writer, so uh, as writers, we want to credit everyone. But uh, one thing that struck me about Wilder is how American he is, and of course, he isn't. He actually, after Austria, moved to Weimar, Germany, and made his first movies there. Uh, and yet, when he came to America, knowing little or no English, he, like all these irritating people like Joseph Conrad and Vladimir Nabokov, ended up doing it better than we do. It's like, <laughs> how dare you? But he clearly had a love for American language and the American spirit, which was different than what he had grown up with, and uh, he embraced it and ended up exemplifying it. Sorry I took so long on the phone, but we're all set. All set for what? I rented a car. To be here at 1 o'clock, we're driving down to Atlantic City. Atlantic City? Oh, I know it's a drag, but you can't find a hotel room in town, not on New Year's Eve. Ring out the old year, ring in the new, ring a ding ding. I didn't plan it this way, Fran. Actually, it's all Baxter's fault. Baxter? Hey, he wouldn't give me the key to the apartment. He wouldn't? No, he just walked out of me. Quit threw that big fat jaw right in my face. The nerve. Yeah, little punk. After all I did for him, said I couldn't bring anybody to the apartment, especially not Miss Kubelik. What's he got against you anyway? I don't know. I guess that's the way it crumbles, cookie-wise. Just the fact that the central conceit of the movie is what convinces her that Baxter is the one for him, basically by, by, by his unwillingness to lend the apartment to Fred McMurray anymore, and you just right. see that play on her face. It's just, it's just brilliant. I mean, it's like the holy grail of screenwriting. If you can have your central conceit be the, the, the big plot turn at the end that, you know. And there's, again, he's a master of juxtaposition because there's nothing sadder than watching her when everyone else is singing all Lang Syne, so full of hope for the future, and there's just this sadness, and that mm -hmm. breaks me up every time I see that. Yeah. And just like that, that juxtaposition of that, then, then the reveal that she's gone, that, that glorious running shot, she's so hopeful now, she's so hopeful and full of light, running into the, the shot, the gunshot, which is revealed to be, you know, a phallic joke, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> Are you all right? 
I'm fine. Are you sure? How's your knee? I'm fine all over. Mind if I come in? Of course not. And then the card thing, and the card thing is, I think, the really kind of interesting thing because there's all this, there's a, almost like identical shot, and this is going to make me sound like I'm a film snob, and I am, but in Luis Buñuel's movie Viridiana, where there's three people now that are playing cards at the end of the movie, which signifies that now there's going to be like a threesome. Mm -hmm. It's a sexual thing, the act of card playing as a kind of metaphor for it's sexual thing that's about to happen. And now they're, now that's in the same thing in this movie, and they're kind of contemporary time period too. And yet they, they made that conscious choice, like she, it always struck me she never takes her coat off. And for, and for some reason, it's just, it's, just, it's just perfect that she doesn't. But there's, a, there's still, the, what I love about when he says, I love you, I adore you, Miss Kubelik, did you hear what I said? And she says, shut up and deal. It's like, we're going to get into some role play now. You know what I mean? It's like, we're going we're gonna to continue this, <laughs> this thing, because been, been, I've been playing a role with, with the Fred McMurray character, and now we're going to have our own sort of sexy time, sexy fun time. And I think that's a really kind of, a, you know, it's again, this subversive, quality of Wilder stuff which manages to like titillate you at the same time that you're crying and laughing and it's amazing. What'd you do with the cards? In there. What about Mr. Sheldrake? I'm gonna send him a fruit cake every Christmas. I love you, Miss Kubelik. Three. Queen. Did you hear what I said, Miss Kubelik? I absolutely adore you. Shut up and deal. One thing that struck me is the first shot, I guess was the first thing we saw in this clip, the first shot of Joey Brown and Jack Lemmon dancing. What was their expression? It was deadpan. Mm -hmm. They weren't smiling. They weren't mugging. They let us take in that hilarious visual without cueing us that we're supposed to laugh. Yeah. The laugh is there. And that's so critical. I think all the great comedy actors and comedy directors know that you don't overplay it. <laughs> that would, that's a set piece, 100%. And yeah. in our movies... In comedies, you always, you know, that, that's been the, the word that people use a lot, set pieces. Um, but he, uh, and I'm sure this was in the, in the writing as, as well as his direction, but he keeps topping it. Every time we cut back, there's a new thing that happens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, first there's, a, as you said, that deadpan shot of them dancing. Then you cut to... Um, you cut to Tony Curtis and Marilyn Monroe. You cut back, and now they've got the flower. You know, so it's a new piece of information, and then they pass the flower back and forth. Then you cut back, and now um, Tony Curtis's glasses are steamed. <laughs> so he keeps topping it every time, and it's very precise. And I'm sure he spent a. They, I'm sure he and uh, who, did he write this with this Diamond? With Diamond, I'm sure he and Diamond spent a ton of time saying, "How can we top it?" Each time, there's new information, and so. I, it, it was hysterical here, but I can just imagine when they previewed it or played it back then, it just I'm, was roaring, rolling laughter, I'm sure, because it kept giving you new stuff every time they cut. I was at USC film school for like five minutes, and there was this guy called Frank Danielle who had started the Columbia Film School with Milos Forman. He was this brilliant, he passed away. And he had this class that he would teach where he would show a movie. Mm -hmm. and then you would watch it again with the volume low, and he would sort of narrate it. And it sounds like really boring, but it was amazing. And he showed, he showed these movies. It was the first time I'd ever heard, John, which John reminded me, the, the word topper. And, and, and that Billy Wilder was just a master of that. I mean, there was the throwaway line earlier about we'll blindfold the band and we'll dance, tango into the night or whatever, and then the, the end of the scene, it's the ultimate topper. They, they cut to the band and they're all blindfolded and you're like, what? <laughs> but it's, it's all planting and payoff, but you comedically, you know? Mm -hmm. but to me, the thing that really strikes 
you know, the, the, is that juxtaposition. The juxtaposition of Tony Curtis and Marilyn Monroe, where Marilyn Monroe is actively trying to seduce him and he's like pretending to be bored, pretending to be like nonplussed. And it, when we cut to Jack Lemmon and Joey Brown, Jack Lemmon at the first shot, he's, they're deadpan, but we know that Joey Brown is very into this. He's in his zone. He's happy because he's dancing with the woman that he loves or that he's attracted to. But Daphne at the beginning is just like, you know, get me out of here. Uh, but then she's, but then as the scene goes on, she's more and more into it. And then by the end of it, she's, you know, we cut back after this scene in the, when uh, Tony Curtis comes back into the hotel room, you know, he's, 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 totally, he's still dancing with the maracas and stuff. Hi, Jerry. Everything under control? Have I got things to tell you? What happened? I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. What? Osgood proposed to me. We're planning a June wedding. <laughs> and so you get that you get that switch that goes on. I think the juxtaposition and the way that the music switches from the romantic music to the tango and back and forth is very you know it's very very great. But one of my favorite shots, favorite lines in the next bit when uh, Jack Lemon. Um, is threatening to basically out Tony Curtis as a fake mm -hmm. to Marilyn Monroe. Tony Curtis has, you know, he says something about a girl from Bryn Mawr. No! What is it, young lady? What are you, you... staring at? This happens to me all the time in public. I recognize him, too. His picture was in Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair? Would you mind moving along, please? Yes, you're in his way. He's waiting for a signal from his yacht. His yacht? It sleeps 12. This is my friend Daphne. She's a Vassar girl. I'm a what? Or was it Bryn Mawr? I heard a very sad story about a girl who went to Bryn Mawr. She squealed on her roommate, and they found her strangled with her own bezier. Yes, we have to be very careful whom we pick for a roommate. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking the, the line in Some Like at Heart where he said, he's a rich millionaire. <laughs> like, if I, if I could write that line, I'm going to see him again tonight and every night. I think he's going to propose to me as soon as he gets up his nerve. That's some nerve. Daphne got a proposal tonight. Really? From a rich millionaire. Oh, that's wonderful. That's the low-hanging fruit. That's not even the, it's just, it's just, you know, I just, I, I re-watched them all in, in anticipation of this. And you just sit there and you're just blown away. And it really inspired me. It freed me that it's actually okay that we, we go to the movies. People don't have to, they don't have to speak like we speak. That's why we go to the movies. You know, the, the, the girl at the cashier at the, at the store doesn't look like Michelle Pfeiffer, but that's why we go to the movies, you know, I think to sort of elevate our, our experience. I call Mama. She was so happy she cried. She wants you to have our wedding gown. It's white lace. Yeah, that's good. I can't get married in your mother's dress. <laughs> she and I, we are not built the same way. We can have it altered. Yeah, I know you don't. That's good. I'm good to level with you. We can't get married at all. Why not? Well, in the first place, I'm not a natural blonde. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. I smoke. I smoke all the time. I don't care. Well, I have a terrible past. For three years now, I've been living with a saxophone player. I forgive you. I can never have children. We can adopt some. But you don't understand, Osgood. Uh, I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. That line is considered the greatest uh, comedy uh, ending line in history. Now, it's a great line, but I've actually thought a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something else going on there. I'm sure Diamond and Wilder didn't specifically think about it, but I think it speaks to Wilder's humanity and uh, some things that uh, he was thinking beyond just the silly comedy, and that is mm -hmm. that Joey Brown is someone who loves no matter what, mm -hmm. literally. It doesn't matter all these things. It doesn't even matter you're a man. I love you. And if you think about it, that's mm -hmm. the most transgressive thought at all, of all. The idea that you don't have to be in love with a woman if you're a man I mean, there's obvious, uh, you know, connections to, to today's world, but, you know, most of the people in, on this planet believe there's an entity who loves us no matter who we are or what we do. 
So he, here Wilder is essentially saying the most transgressive thing of all is yeah. unconditional love. It's so outrageous that we laugh. But isn't that really what we're all after? You've been watching Deconstructing Billy Wilder on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the On Story book series available on Amazon. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com.